Index Astartes, Salamanders, Lords of Greed and Pride. Arrogant and cruel, the Salamanders are heirs to their Primarch's unbridled power. From the very inception, dark rumors circulated about them, but by the time the full extent of their corruption was revealed, it was too late to stop them. The blood of two Primarchs stains the hands of Vulcan, who has long since shed the last trace of humanity left in him to become a demon prince of chaos. Their flesh twisted to reflect the darkness of their souls. The salamanders are a plague upon the galaxy, enslaving all those who fall before them and plundering their riches to sate their immortal greed. Like the ancient drakes of myth, they are unrestrained in their exercise of their power, unburdened by any thought of morality or compassion. With dark fire and blades inscribed with unholy runes, they crush all those who come before them, selfishly striving to emulate the greatest of their Primarch. The greatness of their Primarch. Meanwhile, the black dragon, who slumbers in his lair, awaits the call of great plunder to rise once more and rain doom upon the worlds of man. Origins Born of Fire Knowledge of the Traitor Legion's very existence is forbidden in the Imperium. To all but a few, you know, elite Imperial commanders and officers, planetary governors on regions plagued by raiders, the loyal Space Marine Legions, and of course the agents of the Holy Ordos. But there are histories that have been lost to the passages of time, and others that have faded into little more than legend and myth, whose truth is known only to the God Emperor and those dark souls that still dwell beyond the rings of the Iron Cage, their memory made bitter by, thousand, by ten thousand years of exile and damnation. Such is the case of Vulcan's legend. Most of the Black Dragon's history is forever lost to us, and a few, and a few kernels of fact that remain to us point at a legacy darker and more terrible than perhaps any other of the traitor Primarchs even the arch-traitor Gulliman himself. The tale of Vulcan's life is one of loss and dead triumph, and if the ramblings of those driven insane by studying this saga are to be believed, it is one that is far more, that is far from completion yet. Like all Primarchs, Vulcan was stolen from the Emperor's gene laboratories by the machinations of the ruinous powers and cast across the galaxy. He landed on the world of Nocturne, a death world located in the Ultima Segmentum, circled by an oversized moon named Prometheus. Nocturne was constantly ravaged by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions that made, the per that made permanent construction impossible. Life on that planet, for the few unfortunate souls descended of the colonists who had crashed there centuries before, was harsh and short. By standards of the Imperium, the planet would have been classified as a death world. Unlike the other Primarchs, Vulcan was not found by another member of the human species as a child, nor did he wander alone until his path came, came across that of another descendant of distant Terra. Instead, the young demigod was found by one of Noc Nocturne's great beasts, a gigantic reptilian creature hundreds of years old, who was the subject of legends and campfire stories for the scattered tribes of, th of the surrounding regions. Cassier, they called the beast, one of the few great salamanders, predators who slumbered deep below Nocturne's surface and were only roused by the time of trials, when Prometheus and Nocturne were closest and the world screamed under gravi gravitic force. Vulcan's life pod crashed in the deep volcan volcanic crater at the bottom, of which Kassar made her lair. Her sleep interrupted. The beast rose and approached the source of the disturbance. She found Vulcan emerging from the pod as an infant. And by all rights, the life of the young Primarch should have ended there and then, an outcome that would have been much better for the galaxy. But instead, moved by some primordial instinct, the salamander attached herself to the child as if it were her own. For almost ten Terran standard years, Vulcan remained in isolation with Kasser, raised by the great beast. The salamanders left the crater to hunt and bring back the carcass of another lesser, lesser example of Nocturne's megafauna, 
so that Vulcan might feed upon them. She also brought in living specimens, and Vulcan learned how to fight and kill for himself. Feeding on the rich meat of Nocturne's beast, Vulcan grew quickly and strong. His body further, further toughened by the harsh conditions of his lair. The crater in which he, li he lived was fairly secure, but rock falls from the sides, flows of lava bursting from the depths and radiation-poisoned winds were common. It is believed that it was during that time that his skin darkened and his eyes took on the glowing red tint as an adaptive response to the hostile conditions. But the first true challenge Vulcan would face came when, after ten years, the instincts of Carsi moved on to their next phase. Nocturne salamanders were fiercely protective of their young, as it must be for the species to have a chance of surviving on the harsh world. But once their spawn had reached a certain age, their children became rivals for limited food resources, and needed to leave the nest and carve their own territory. Normally, young salamanders knew this instinctively, but Vulcan was no mere beast, and so, when the creature he had come to consider his own mother suddenly turned on him, he was caught completely by surprise. Agony. It coursed through his body as the claws of his mother tore through his flesh. Never in all his life had he ever known such pain. He had been wounded before, when he had fought the beast she had brought so that he would learn to defend himself. But never like this. His belly had been torn open, though his organs remained inside, something that had never happened with any of his previous foes, but the little to diminish the terrible pain. Again and again she stroked at him, and it was all he could do to rise his arms in defense, until he felt too weak to even do that. Then the claws came for his throat, and he fell, a crimson torrent, torrent pouring from his ravaged body. Darkness took him, and then, in a flash of light and heat, his eyes snapped open. There was no more pain. He looked and saw that his body was whole, though the ground was still soaked with his blood. The weakness from moments ago was gone, yet his mother was still staring down at him, her claws red with his blood. She had killed him, yet he lived again, and though she appeared confused, her confusion quickly gave way to renewed fury, and she lunged towards him once more. He lived again, but if he did nothing, he would die again. With a mighty roar, he rose to his feet and punched the reptilian creature for in the side of her jaw, sending her tumbling to the ground with greater force than he had ever displayed before. He felt as if his body was on fire, fueled by the very power of the ground on which he stood. He will, not be help he will not be a helpless victim of this creature's rage any longer. He would not let her hurt him. He would never let anything hurt him. And if that meant that he had to kill her, then so be it. But he was a Primarch, and emerged victorious. Though not before making a terrible discovery that would set him apart from the rest of his brothers forever. Vulcan could not die. After being slain by the Carsi in battle, in the battle's first moments, he had risen from the dead, restored to full health, and possessed, possessed of an even greater vigor than before. Defeated the creature that had raised him since infancy, and defeated the creature that had raised him since infancy, you get it. It was then that Vulcan learned that he was a perpetual, though he would not learn that term and what it meant until much, much later in life. The Perpetuals. Death is inevitable. It is the one thing that binds all members of the human species together. From the lowest dreg in the Underhive to the Lord Governor of an entire sector, all are bound by the inevitability of death. The Emperor alone, so the Ecclesiarchy teaches us, is beyond death. And even then, it is because he moved beyond it when he shed his human form and became a god. Even, even Xenos species must obey the same law, and say for the unliving legions of the Necrons or the accursed spirits of the Neverborn, all things must eventually face the Reaper. To have a soul, no matter how wretched or tainted, is to live in the shadow of death. Except that such 
is not the case, and in the deepest archives of the Inquisition, the truth is written behind, be, behind half-forgotten myths and legends. There are those who are untouched by death, who go through the passage of millennia unaffected. Hundreds upon hundreds of years might pass, and yet they remain the same, returning even from the most hideous and complete death looking none the worse for wear. They are known as the Perpetuals, and each of them is a power in him, in him or herself, not because of any particular power they might possess. They have none, save for the ability to return from death, but because of the skills they have picked up during their long, multiple lives. The fact that Vulcan, the only perpetual Primarch, turned against the Imperium and the Emperor, has led many of the Inquisitors aware of, the, of their existence, to hunt down the Perpetuals as potential agents of chaos. But apart from the Black Dragon, none of these immortals have ever been known to bow before the Dark Gods. It is possible that the Ruinous Powers have nothing to offer to an immortal, or that the wisdom and knowledge that comes with such long existence inevitably reveals the Primordial Annihilator for the abomination that it is, making submission to it insane evil impossible insane evil impossible for any sane being still those arguing for the systemic hunting and capture of the perpetuals and argue that for someone who doesn't who does not who does not know death the lives of all those around are by necessity lessened in value what does one mortal life matter to an immortal after all once victorious vulcan set to work and crafted for himself a cloak and a suit of armor from the corpse of the beast, wearing the skull upon his shoulder. He then turned his attention on how to escape the great crater that had been his world for years. Within a few days he was climbing out, following the steps left in the walls by the claws of his beast mother. Outside he beheld Nocturne's landscape for the first time, a desolated land riven by earthquakes and lava eruptions. He also saw in the far distance the sign of civilization, and his long dormant instincts told him that he would find he would find more of his kind there. And despite the dangers of their world, the people of Nocturne had managed to build seven cities on places where the land was the least agitated. The city found by Vulcan, Hesod, was called the Seat of Kings, and was the most influential of the sanctuaries of Nocturne. When Vulcan presented himself at the city's doors, he was welcomed in, though the guards surprises, surprised that seeing a lone wanderer survive to reach their gate quickly turned to shock and fear when they saw him up close. To the mortal eye, Vulcan was black-skinned, was a black-skinned giant with burning red eyes, clad in the skin of one of Nocturne's most powerful beasts and wearing its, and wearing its skull upon his shoulder. They fell on their knees before his might and awe, awed and terrified in equal measure. Vulcan was introduced to Hesod's ruler, and after only a few days he was capable of speaking fluently in Nocturne's harsh, but strangely poetic language. By some strange twist of fate, Vulcan saw a blacksmith's shop while visiting the city, and asked to work there. Something of the shaping of the metal and the creation of instruments of war and peace appealed to him, and seeing his cloak, the, back, the blacksmith welcomed him with open arms. In only a few days, Vulcan had surpassed, surpassed his first teacher. Within a, few, within a few weeks, he was the greatest smith in all of Hesod. Half, of Nocturnian, half a Nocturnian year after Vulcan's arrival to Hesod, one of the many cataclysms, cataclysms of plaguing plaguing the death world had happened once more. Unlike the fury of the earth or the beast that roamed in the wasteland, this scourge came from beyond Nocturne. It came from the dark places between realities, where the scions of dread Komorog dwell. For centuries, dark elf slavers had preyed upon the people of Nocturne, hunting them down for sport and capturing them as slaves. Hardy, hardy and resilient, the Nocturnians made excellent slaves for the cruel Xenos, known to their victims as the mid-shrouded Duskrates. The time, however, this time, however, things were different. A Primarch was here. Vulcan fought the Duskrates in the streets of Hesod, 
killing dozens of them and leading the city's people into repelling at the Xenos. The king of Hazor had been slain in the confusion. Dark rumors claimed that he was killed not by the Duskrace, but by Vulcan himself. The Lord of Drakes, as he was called by the grateful population, was offered the throne, which he seized immediately before calling his people to war. The dust raids were still harassing the other cities, as he intended to free them uh, from their invaders' depredations. Within a few weeks, Vulcan had crafted powerful weapons for Hesiod's most powerful warriors, those who had proven themselves in his eyes when fighting back the raids in the city's streets. City by city, Vulcan and his army fought and defeated the dust raids, gaining new followers at each step, by, uh, each step of the way. However, by the time they reached the seventh city, what name is that? Skarok, the dread el dread the dark Eldars had escalated their activities, driven into frenzy by the news of their preys unexpectedly fighting back. When Vulcan entered the Dragon Spire as Skarakork, whatever was known, it had become a pit of horrors where the only living humans were kept in a state of perpetual agony by their tormentors' cruel devices. Vulcan's army marched through the city, their heart full of vengeance, but it was all they could do to end their victim's pain. The dust raids had long since departed. Vulcan swore that such an atrocity would never happen again. He declared that Skarok would stand forever as a reminder to the rest of the cities of the price of weakness and the need for strong, unified leadership. With almost no opposition, Vulcan was proclaimed master of the six remaining city sanctuaries and began to work on rebuilding Nocturne according to his own vision. A powerful military was created, led by warlords equipped with weapons and armor crafted by, Vulcan, crafted by Vulcan's own hands, and hunted the beasts around the cities, making it safer for the people to mine the prodigious wealth of Nocturne's earth. Under Vulcan's rule, Nocturne became a much safer place for its people. Vulcan had the nearly prenatural instinct for predicting the swifts, shifts, yeah, the shifts in the earth, and was able to prevent much of the yearly death toll that had be become part of Nocturne's life. Out of respect and fear for their coal skinned overlord, the six cities sent prodigious amounts of gemstones and precious minerals to Vulcan's throne in Hazod. With these, the Lord of Drakes forged weapons, but also wondrous works of art that were exposed in his castle, and people flocked from all over Nocturne to see them. It was the first time in recording Nocturnian history that the clans had the opportunity to truly enjoy beauty rather than fight for their survival. At the same time, Vulcan did not tolerate dissent, and those who opposed his rule or spoke out against him were quickly disposed of by his loyal supporters. The only exceptions were those who possessed useful skills or connection. connections. They were brought before Vulcan himself, where the natural presence of the, of the Primarch soon overwhelmed them and turned them into the most devoted servants of the Lord of Drakes. Peace and civil order were maintained through an unyielding military rule, and all were expected to serve the will of Vulcan. This system was brutal, but effective, and perhaps the only one that could have worked on a death world such as Nocturne. We'll never know. When the Emperor came to Nocturne, he found his son at the head of a powerful and prosperous empire, carved out of the savagery of the world that might very well have claimed his life. The Master of Mankind descended on Nocturne in disguise, and used the ancient rituals of trials of the world to challenge Vulcan's might and intellect. Vulcan emerged triumphant in every trial and demanded to know who was this outsider who dared question his fitness to rule. Then the Emperor revealed himself in his true glory, and Vulcan knew that he had finally found someone who did not stand by, the, by their very nature beneath him. It is said that he laughed when he saw the Emperor the first time he ever did so, he ever did so in the memory of his servants, for he believed that at long last, he will no longer be alone. There are even tales of the that the Emperor joined in his son's joy in a display of innocence that will later be cruelty shattered. That will be so cruelly shattered. The Emperor told Vulcan of the great galaxy, of the thousand wor of worlds that needed to be brought out of the darkness and into the light of civilization. 
He praised Vulcan's work on Nocturne and spoke of the legends that had been crafted from his blood. This legion, the sons of Vulcan, direly needed his leadership. But first, the Lord of Drakes needed to learn the knowledge he would require to fulfill his role as a general of the Imperium's Great Crusade. He was also told he also told the young Primarch about his brothers, those who had been created in the same way he had been. I don't know why I did that. Eager to meet his siblings and face the new challenges of the Great Crusade, Vulcan accepted the Emperor's offer. He left the ruling of Nocturne to his subordinates, but ensured that they would have the Imperium support and that the children of the six cities would be tested for the honor of joining his legion. For several years after that, Vulcan fought at the side of the Emperor. His true nature kept secret while he learned the skills of a commander and the structure and technology of the Imperium. Rumors about the mysterious warrior clad in green draconic armor spread wildly across the forces of the Great Crusade, and speculation as to his true nature was rife, until the day the Emperor judged Vulcan to be ready to reveal himself and take the place that was rightfully his. The Great Crusade Tyrants Among Shepherds On the anvil of war are the strong tempered, and the weak made to perish. Thus are men's souls tested as metal in the forge's fire. We are the champions of this new age, my sons, and we shall forge the future for Yes, and we shall forge the future of all mankind with our deeds. Like the blacksmiths shaping the blade, we cannot afford to be kind to the material we use. Only by beating it into shape shall we make it strong enough to weather the passage of time and threats. For make no mistake, there are threats uncounted awaiting the stars, Xenos that would see mankind wiped out from the galaxy, if they had the chance and leg if they had the chance and legacies of our ancestors' failure slumbering on forgotten worlds, waiting for the foolish to rouse them once more. Only through strength can we defend ourselves from these perils by crushing all those who oppose the Imperium's rule of the stars. Where is it? Greatest of all the dangers, however, is disunity. When, man when mankind first took to the stars, it scattered without, without care, no, without care, no plan, without care nor plan. I think you want to say, but whatever. The leaders of each colony ship seeking to create their own isolated society. This mistake cost them terribly, for no world can stand alone in the universe. Even if they resist us, even if they refuse the gift of compliance. We must force it down their throats no matter how much damage is done in the process. Because without us, they will die at the hands of one threat or another, and that threat will go stronger from feasting upon them before coming for us next. The people of the Imperium might look at you and see monsters, weapons of war, removed from humanity by the gene forging that made you what you are. And perhaps they are right, but it does not matter. All that matters is that mankind needs army strong enough to survive, and you, are the, and you are that army. You are the salamanders, the primordial beasts found bound to the Emperor's will, that he will bring order to the stars and strength to mankind. Let nothing stand in our way as we conquer the galaxy for my father. Let none oppose us, for to fail is to do far worse than to die. This is, it is to sentence our entire species to extinction. Let nothing stand in our way as we... Okay, I lost the thing. Okay, it is to sentence our entire species to existence, as we will become no more than another footnote in galactic history, to be forgotten by those who will rise from our ashes. But we will, but we will not be broken by that endless, vicious, and cruel cycle. We shall master it, and in doing so, we shall become immortal. Passage from the decree of Primarch Vulcan after taking command of the 18th Legion. Even before Vulcan's discovery, the 18, the 18 Legion's reputation was a dark one. Their creation has been shrouded in secrecy by the Emperor. Their first warriors kept away from the other legions for unknown purposes. Dark rumors circulated among the citizens of the Emperor's domain, especially when the only two other legions to be treated this way were the 6th and 20th, both of which would come to be feared and revealed in equal measure over time. 
though for very different reasons and the very different outcome. The appearance of the legionnaires only aggravated the issue, while foolish, yeah, while foolish discrimination based on skill and color had long since disappeared in an imperium fighting against the mutator horrors created by the techno barbarians. The 18 legions gene seed caused those it was implemented into to develop thick, thick scale like scale like black skin and red glowing eyes. These traits gave them an inhuman appearance. That's Wait a minute. That surpassed the mere size and proportion of transhumans. Combined with the attitude of these warriors on the battlefield, fearful whispers of devils and monsters spread among the human forces deployed alongside them. The warriors of the 18th Legion were first revealed to the rest of the Emperor's servants near the end of the Unification War, when they were unleashed in the assault of the on the Tempest Galleries. This was during the final extermination of the Ethanarchy, a cabal of insane gene twisters controlling thousands of enhanced transhumans of their own, and circles of chemically enslaved psychers, as well as possessing many technological relics of immense power. Earlier in the Unification Wars, the Ethnarchy had been contained in the Caucasus, waste at a terrible price. Millions had been lost, and more than 10,000 Thunder Warriors had perished as well. Using burrow engines, the 20,000 Astartes of the 18th Legion infiltrated the Ethnarchy's last fortress from below in order to sabotage its massive and powerful defenses. At the core of the fortress, they fought not against flesh and blood, but the antique, near sentient constructs that were tasked with the de defense of the complex, which drained energy from the very molten core of Terra. Between the brutally hostile environment and the highly intelligent and powerful foes, it took, the it took all the Astartes had to triumph. They finally succeeded in silencing the malevolent machine spirits that dominated the complex, sending its cogitators down into an ocean of lava. But by that time, less than a thousand of them remained. Without the defense grid, the last city of the Ethnarchy fell its leaders brought in chains before the Emperor, so that he might learn the secrets that had allowed this blasphemous kingdom to stand in his way for so long. While the 18th Legion earned much honor for his battle, with its number so dramatically reduced, it was unable to join the Great Crusade as soon as other legions, instead being deployed as one massive force. The sons of Missing Vulcan were assigned in small groups to individual forces needing a starty support. Scattered across the Great Crusade, these groups rarely amounted to more than a hundred warriors, an elite force for the commander of the expeditionary fleet to call upon in case of dire need. This meant that every battle the legionaries experienced was dangerous and desperate even by the standards of Astartes, and casualty rates remained as high as the honors the legion continued to gain over the dead bodies of its members. This created a brutal mentality among the warriors of the Legion, who did not expect to live long and only saw value in their lives if they died honorable and worthy deaths. The coming of Vulcan changed all that. For all his faults and later treachery, there is no denying that during the Great Crusade, Vulcan was fiercely protective of his son's lives. Whatever this was due to any genuine bond, the duty, right, the duty of a general to his soldiers or the callous calculation of a warlord seeking to preserve his most valuable assets. The Lord of Drakes made sure to change his son's mentality. He named him the Salamanders, so, they would, they so that they would carry on the legacy of strength and, and a near invincibility of these great beasts. He gathered them all in one force, not hesitating a single moment to use his Primarch's authority to revoke the oaths that had, been, that had bound them to other armies. United under his command, and with fresh recruits coming in from Nocturne, the 18th Legion was saved from the brink of annihilation and reborn as a potent fighting force for the Great Crusade. In barely a few years, the Salamander's numbers were in the thousands once more, and a century after the Crusade had begun, they were, if not the most numerous legion, at last no longer considered in danger of dying off. 
Vulcan's time as ruler of Nocturne had given him a keen eye for the ambition among mortal men, and he quickly formed a web of allegiances with other commanders, offering his legion's support, but also personal, personal presence of weapons and armor crafted with his own hands. The commanders of the Imperial army, honored with such princely, princely gifts, dedicated the forces under their command to Vulcan's endeavor in the Great Crusade, and later formed the core of the human armies who turned against the Emperor alongside him. Outside of these allied worthies, whatever, however, the Salamanders were regarded as mighty but exceedingly brutal warriors. Vulcan's tactics were brutal, aimed at minimizing Imperial losses and achieving quick compliances with little regard for the collateral damage. And they worked. In the Battle of Antim, the first in which the Lord of Drakes fought side by side with his reunited legion, his tactical instincts served him well against the numberless hordes of the orcs. Using the fire weaponry and the first and the first of the strange, deadly weapons Vulcan had forged after learning the secrets of the Mechanicum, the orcs were slaughtered to the last. With the green skin, with the green skin menace curtailed, the salamanders quickly pacified the, this entire region of the Halo Stars, destroying several other Xenos threats that had plagued the human worlds of the sector during old night. Vulcan rejoined a task at a, wait. Vulcan rejoiced at a task well done, and vowed that he would repeat his success and suppress suppress it in the rest of the crusade. But Vulcan failed to realize that without the pressing threat to make them welcome, the Imperium's assistance with open arms, many of the human communities scattered across the galaxy would cling fiercely to their independence. This was the purpose of the liter iterators, I guess. To convince them, to convince these reluctant children of Terra to return to her embrace. In Vulcan's eyes, however, any who refused to join the Imperium were either ignorant or foolish, and time spent discussing with them was time wasted during which another world's cries for help against galactic dangers weren't unanswered. His conquests were quick and violent, as he did not hesitate to use whatever means would lead to the, ar to the enemy's surrender uh, most quickly. While his methods often left the military forces of the worlds brought to compliance in ruins and the ruling class decimated, the Salamanders refrained from causing civilian casualties where possible. This was not out of any lingering kindness in their heart, but a matter of supreme pragmatism. The dead made poor imperial citizens, and butchering civilians often made an enemy surrender all but impossible. Avenging one's dead family, the Salamanders quickly learned, was a cause that would make even the most cowardly of men take up arms and fight to the death without ever considering giving up. The Alliance of Noverion had stood for 6,000 years, surviving through the horrors of the Dark Age of Technology and the Age of Strife that followed it. Their fleets and armies had kept their borders safe from alien predations. Yes, predations. Twelve star systems linked in a stable warp route and united in the name of survival and prosperity. It only took one year for the Salamanders to reduce the Alliance to ruin. After the failure of the first diplomatic overtures, Vulcan decreed that the Alliance's defiance of the Imperium would not be tolerated. Their ships were broken in the world's skies, burning fragments raining upon doomed cities. Their armies were crushed on the field of battle, executed to the last as retribution for the few fallen salamanders. World after world fell, the ruling class annihilated and the population cowed in terror as the legion moved on to the next planet. Until at last, Vulcan's flagship darkened the heavens above the Alliance capital world. In desperation, the Alliance leaders attempted diplomacy one last time. It was on the, the bridge of the Flame Roth when their plea was received and saw and heard the Primarch's response. These men and women have been broken, shown their insignificance next to the power of the Imperium. They offered their lives in return for their people being spared, and their few remaining soldiers being allowed to surrender honorably. Vulcan smiled. The most terrifying thing I have ever seen, and I have journeyed through the warp, congratulated them on their moral courage, and agreed to their offer of capitulation. 
The planet was taken without a single shot. The soldiers of the Alliance were disarmed and sent back to their homes. After a year of rebuilding ruins, the adepts of the Administratum were relieved to finally see a world brought to compliance, without the salamanders almost completely destroying its infrastructure first. I never found out what happened to the leaders of the Alliance after they surrendered. From the Forbidden Accounts in the Shadow of the Dragon, by Navy Officer Thorsten Veller. Volkern regarded his more human brothers as naive, and believed that eventually the rigors of the Great Crusade would bring them to see the galaxy as he did. A harsh and unforgiving place that deemed that the strong rule over the weak. While close to Rogo Dorn and Ferus Manus, who both shared his outlook, he was shunned by the rest of the Primarchs, save for Gulliman. The Primarch of the Ultramarines often met with, the, with his Nocturnian brother, trying to convince him to change his views through long and passionate debates into, into the merits of their various approaches to the rest of mankind. These reunions created a bond between them stronger than any Vulcan shared with his other brothers, for while he never changed his mind and remained certain that Gulliman would change his in time, he appreciated the fact that Robute was the only one to not have given up on him. The two of them often discussed one of Vulcan's most secret and surprising passions, a deep and true interest for the ancient arts and histories. According to Remembrancers, the collection of the Lord of Drakes was staggering both in scope and in quality, hosting relics from all of mankind's eras, from the Dark Age of Technology all the way back before the first man discovered writing. In those days, Vulcan was fascinated by the flow of history, though it might have all been a front to hide his secret research into discovering the traces left by other immortals across the eons. In hindsight... <laughs> In hindsight, and with knowledge of the secret Vulcan tries so hard to hide, though he faced little difficulties never encountering any foe he could not defeat without resorting to his peculiar gift, the patterns in the Lord of Drake's actions are obvious. Whenever a human world colonized in the early epochs was discovered in regions he was tasked to conquer, he would always begin with, diplomatic, with a diplomatic phase, even if such efforts were obviously going to be fruitless. In the case of the Monarchy of Blood, yes, the Monarchy of Blood, his insistence that the iterators discuss with the ruling king was downright criminal, as it sent dozen, a dozen men and women to certain death. At the time, Vulcan claimed that these were the results of his efforts to mend his ways in a fashion more agreeable to his brothers. But the truth has since been revealed by the Inquisition's research. On every such world, Vulcan sought to buy time in order to investigate the planet's ancient history, searching for clues of the actions of another immortal such as himself. Whether he found any other perpetual, that way is unknown. There are no traces of such discovery in the records accessible to us. But surely, had Vulcan succeeded, he would have kept it even more secret than the rest of his shadowy quest. Regardless, Vulcan's investigation also yielded a trove of technological lore that he hoarded like the beast of myth he had begun to be compared to. He used his knowledge to craft even more devastating weapons, placing them aboard the, aboard the grandest of all his accomplishments, the forged ship Chalice of Fire. Eventually, 200 years after the beginning of the Great Crusade, the Emperor called the Primarchs the Triumph of Ulanor. The master of mankind, noble Horus, stalwart Perturabo, elusive Jagatai, had defeated the greatest orc empire to have ever been encountered, and the emperor wanted to honor those who had fought there, and through them all the soldiers fighting the Great Crusade, human or otherwise. Wait, kind of lost. <laughs> okay, human or otherwise. Vulcan was there with a group of his most elite warriors, the Pyre Guard. Veterans of the legions, from the days before Vulcan had been found. They took part in the parade and marched between the gazes, the gaze of the gathered Primarchs with pride. When the Emperor announced that he was returning to Terra and taking Magnus with him, while leaving Horus in command of the Great Crusade, Vulcan wasn't as shocked as much as he was intrigued. The Lord of the Drakes had ever suspected his father was keeping secrets from the Primarchs, 
just as Vulcan himself was keeping secrets from his sons and father alike. He attempted to uncover these secrets, believing that they might help the clue in his own quest for answers. But every investigation, legal or otherwise, was met with an adamantium wall of failure and the sudden silence of infiltrated agents. Vulcan's mood grew sour in response to these repeated failures. His tactics grew increasingly brutal, and even more downright cruel on occasion. Soon, the title of Lord of Drakes was replaced by another, whispered fearfully by the civilians of the Imperium, and the soldiers of the Imperial Army alike. The Black Dragon. Tales of entire cities being butchered as punishment for the refusal to bend the knee of grotesque mutation being visited upon surrendered enemy armies to prevent them from ever fighting again circulated across expeditionary fleets. But it wasn't until Karatan that things came to a head. The leaders of the city-state of Karatan had heard of Vulcan's aggression, their own primitive astropaths picking up the screams of nearby systems. These nightmares, nightmarish visions had painted them an image of the Imperium as a blood-drenched dictatorship, where cruel warlords slaughtered with impunity, while a distant emperor let them do as they pleased. After a single diplomatic meeting, on the off chance that the visions had been wrong, or deceitful, Karatan cut all contact with the expeditionary fleet hanging in their system, and prepared for war. Vulcan ordered the salamanders to land in mass on the planet, and prepare to lay siege and break, this, and break the cities one by one, forcing the leaders who had, suffered, who had insulted him to watch as he did so. The first assault began, however, as the first assault began, however, a new fleet entered the system, much smaller than the Salamander's own. Conrad Kurz, the, the King of Night, had come, thinking to aid his brother in bringing Karatan, peacefully, into the Imperium's embrace. Instead, he found the planet at war and sent his Night Lords into the fray. Ostensibly, this was to help the Salamanders. But in truth, the savior of Nostramo had, the dark, had dark suspicions regarding his brother. Though even, worse, though even his worst fear would fall short of reality. With the help of the Night Lords, the Salamanders quickly took the first of the city-states, only for Vulcan to order the one-fifth one of the population to be executed, whether civilian soldiers, rich or poor, young or old. One out of every five inhabitants of the city would be killed. To teach the survivors the pride of opposing the Imperium in general, and Vulcan in particular. Curse's rage and horror when he learned the news were terrible, and only the fact that he was on the other side of the planet prevented him from physically attacking Vulcan, as he would do with Dorn soon after. Instead, after his pleas for stopping were ignored, the King of Night withdrew his forces from the campaign, taking with him the entire population of the last city that still stood unbroken. Are you mad, brother? What purpose could such slaughter of innocence possibly serve? Do you so thirst for dominance that you care not how many lives you crush? I swear that if you do not stop this instantly, immediately, me and every single one of my sons shall not rest until our father's wrath comes down upon you for your crimes. Attributed to Conrad Kurz during the Kartan incident. After the events of the Kartan, Kurz sent a report that had... Well, he sent a report of what had happened to the Council of Terra, including recorded evidence of the Salamander's excessive behavior, not just on the world, but in the numerous other operations. However, the message was subject to the usual verges of the warp, and it took years for actual actions to be taken. The reply, when it came, bore the sigil, the sigil of Malkador himself, it demanded that Vulcan and his sons return to Terra to, to explain their actions, both in the Kartan affair and in the many other instances of excessive forces that had happened during the Great Crusade. Curse and ten of his warriors, the Lord of Drakes, to carry the, sig the Sigilite's message. Nothing was ever heard again of these envoys, for soon after their departure, news of Gulliman's treachery reached the Imperium, the Salamander's transgressions lost their importance in the light of this new heresy. Ten sons of Nostramo laid in pieces across Vulcan's throne room, 
when Artelus Numeon crossed the threshold. The Lord of Drake sat on his throne, eyes fixed upon the carnage his weapon, Dawnbringer, had wrought. The massive ornate warhammer rested at the side of the throne, still covered in the lifeblood of the legionaries it had torn to fragments. Artelus walked through the carnage cautiously, eyes fixed on his Primarch, searching for signs that his rage hadn't yet abated. When the 8th Legion's small ship had emerged in system and the Night Lords had demanded an audience with Vulcan, the Lord of Drakes had been amused, if anything, and he had welcomed them aboard his ship, the Flame Rot. Then the Night Lords had asked that all salamanders leave the room when they delivered their message to Vulcan alone, hinting at the authority behind their orders. Vulcan had grown more agitated then, but had agreed to the demands. That had been nine hours ago, as long as Artus dared to wait before returning into the room. Rouse the astropaths, said the Primarch at last, turning from the bloody scene to his first captain. Think it's time I answer Gulliman's invitation. The Heresy Conquests and Secrets I suppose out of all of them, Vulcan turning traitor should have surprised us least. He was always the most brutal the most ruthless and unrelenting in his approach to conquest. But we were all brutal in our own way, and we had all been ruthless and unwilling to compromise our ideals. This is what it meant to be a Primarch in the first place, to be one of the genetically forged generals of mankind. And there is another thing scholars and historians will fail to understand. Any of our brothers turning against the Imperium in the first place was supposed to be impossible. We couldn't conceive it, or at least I could not, until the very moment when my boots landed on the black sands of Ishvan V and the sounds of my brother's legions firing upon my sons reached my ears. The betrayal of Gur Gulliman, Dorn, Ferus, and Sanguinius felt more like nightmares than a reality. How could, they not, how could they not have seen it coming? Generations will cry as they learn of the horrors of this war. How could they let this happen? They were our brothers. We fought and bled at their side. We saved their lives and they saved ours. The true question is, how could we possibly have seen it coming? If treachery did not hurt so much, it wouldn't be nearly as effective. If evil wasn't so unthinkable, it wouldn't be so evil. From the Private Memories of Primarch Mortarion, written during the Robotian Heresy. While the treachery of the salamanders might seem obvious in hindsight, there is actually very little hard evidence as to exact means by which Gulliman conceived, convinced Vulcan to join him in rebellion against his father. There does not seem to have been any attempt by the ruinous powers to court his attention prior to the events of Ishvan. His search for other perpetuals might have caused him to research ancient sorcery, but for the records of, this, of his investigation, it seems Vulcan was, at the time of the Great Crusade, still enough of a believer in the Imperial truth that he steered of such dangerous matters. All we have, then, are theories and suspicions. The most probable cause of Vulcan's treachery is that, after learning of his coming censure, he was approached by Gulliman, who told him the same lies about the, em about the Emperor he had been told himself knowing that war was coming to the Imperium and eager to escape the consequences of his crimes, the Black Dragon then willingly joined forces with Robut. Or perhaps it was whatever passed for brotherly love in Vulcan's heart that convinced him to sigh with the other brother he was truly close to. No matter the risk. Another theory is that Vulcan knew that the Dark Gods had bestowed strange and previously unknown lore upon Gulliman and his cohorts, and that he believed that this lore had held the key to his long obsessions of understanding his own immortality. Regardless of the truth, Vulcan came to the Ishvan system to help Gulliman's cause, and while still draped in the, pretend, the pretense of loyalty to the Emperor. During the journey, his legion's ranks were called of those who would not follow the Primarch in betrayal, and a quick and silent purge. Then came the assault of the traitor's position. Vulcan was assigned as part of the second wave, supposed to follow in the wake of the Night Lords, Death Guard and Alpha Legion to secure their gains and crush the rebels with overwhelming force. 
The testimonies of the Ishvan survivors indicated that salamanders born, born no obvious sign of war-born corruption, such as the ultramarines and iron hands displayed. The librarians of the salamanders showed no unholy powers of the black sand, on the black sands of the Urgaur Plateau, only the natural proficiency with pyromancy that had been their hallmark during the Great Crusade. The single difference was that the sons of Vulcan were now using their skills and tactic against their own cousins. Vulcan fought against Conrad Kurz there, when the King of Night willingly sacrificed himself so that his brothers and their sons might escape Gulman's trap. The Black Dragon, for all his power, was no match against the unleashed fury, fury of Kurz, who had finally let loose the darkest abilities, secure, securing the knowledge he would be dead long before they could turn him into a monster. Time and again did the King of Night slay his brother, only for Vulcan to rise, his immortality finally revealed to both his sons and the other traitor legions. The secret of the Black Dragon was out in the open at last, and it is likely that Vulcan felt relieved at, the, at this grand revelation. Finally, Vulcan struck Kurz down, the Primarch's body fa falling in the hands of the Salamanders, who promptly plundered it for trophies, before being pushed back by the vengeful Night Guard, led by Talos Valkron. The Soul, Hunters, the Soul Hunter directed his brothers, and they reclaimed the body of their father, while Vulcan was still reeling from the mental exhaustion of his many resurrections. Soon the massacre was over, and the other traitor Primarch started to look upon Vulcan with, mis with mixed respect and fear, wondering how it was that their brother had gained such powerful gifts. The Black Dragon replied to their inquiries on the subject only with cold, deadly silence. Soon, the traitor legions were convinced that his mortality was the result of some dark pact of his own past with the newly discovered gods of the warp. His brother was dead, and he had been the one to kill him. When Dawnbringer had fallen upon Curse's chest and blasted his hearts to pieces, Vulcan has still believed deep within that he was not the only one of his brothers that could not die. None of the Primarchs had ever died before, after all. If you didn't believe in the rumors whispered about the Sixth and their secret campaigns. Only when he had seen his brother's corpse had Vulcan realized that he had, be that he had believed Curse would rise again. Suddenly aware of the folly of it all, understanding the meaninglessness of other mortal lives, and embracing Vulcan as his brother. But instead, Conrad had remained dead, staring at him with eyes that, even in death, judged him and command condemned him. That had been why he had stepped back, why he had done nothing as the Night Lords killed his sons and took Conrad's body with them. For the first time in his life, he had felt horror and regret. In his chambers aboard the flame rot, Vulcan brooded on these dark thoughts, ignoring the summons of Gulliman that he attended the war count that he attended the war council that would decide the next stage of the war. He was staring at a fire pit, and it seemed to him as if the shadow cast by the flickering light danced on the walls with malevolent intent, closing in on him from all directions. Then, with a mighty roar, he cast down the fire and rose before storming out of the chamber, leaving Dawnbringer inside, still covered in the blood of the King of Night. Never again would Vulcan touch the weapon he had forged with his own hands. And never again he vowed to himself would he do anything and regret it afterwards. After Ishvan, the Salamanders then spread across the galaxy in several groups, led by com commanders appointed by Vulcan himself. These groups did not join the push towards Terra led by Gulliman and Manus. Instead, they focused on the conquest of vast swaths of the Imperium, forcing Trillians to kneel and swear fealty to the Black Dragon, and through him, to Gulliman. Some among the traitor legions began to suspect that Vulcan was building a power base more loyal to him than to the Rebellion. They feared that in time, Vulcan would turn against Gulliman, seeking to rule his own empire. Where these concerns were warranted is ultimately irrelevant, but illustrates perfectly the distrust and corruption of loyalty that inflict the traitor legions to this day. 
While most worlds were no match for the power of the 18th Legion, the defenders of worlds loyal to the throne world were not without allies. The Night Lords and Alpha Legion had scattered across after the massacre, their warriors vowing to get vengeance on those who had betrayed them. While the bulk of the 8th Legion traveled to the Ultima Segmentum to take part in the Tramas Crusade, thousands of sons of Nostromo remained to help the resistance. The Salamanders found themselves facing the Night Lord's guerrilla tactics on dozens of worlds, and one of their leaders, Zohal Sahal, was even responsible for the loss of the legendary Chalice of Fire, in including all the terrible weapons aboard the vessel. Boy, we have a big one for the Chalice of Fire. The Chalice of Fire. Vulcan was as much a blacksmith as he was a warrior. And what few archives have survived the Great Crusade tell us, tell us that he had forged many great and terrible weapons during that time, combining his keen instincts with the lore he gained from the Mechanicus and the worlds he conquered. When word of his betrayal reached the Imperium, many feared that he would turn these weapons against the worlds of mankind, and what the consequences would be, for these were no mundane tools of destruction, but artifacts of immense power that even the Salamanders had been reluctant to use during the Great Crusade. All of them had been gathered by Volca in a ship that itself was one of them, the Chalice of Fire, a vast forged ship armed with a laser array known as the Eye of Vulcan. This ship was under the command of the first Salamander's forge father, Tekel. In the skies above Ishvan V, the Chalice was responsible for the destruction of the 19 vessels of the Loyal Legions, blasted to pieces by its weapons. But the lords of the Imperium on Terra were not the only ones aware of the threat possessed by Vulcan's artifacts. Soon after the massacre, a force of night lords struck great blow against the Salamanders. Led by Zoso Sahal, a member of the Circle of Shadows known as the Talon Master, a splinter group of the 8th Legion ambushed the Chalice of Fire while was traveling under the Light Escort deep in traitor space. The chalice was too powerful for Sahal's flotilla to destroy in the void, and so the Talon Master and his warriors boarded it instead, sacrificing most of their ships in order to do so. According to what little information is available to us, there was some dissent in the ranks of Sahal's group. Some warriors want to destroy the chalice and deny the traitors the use of its contents while others wanted to make use of the weapons themselves to avenge the loss of their Primarch and help with the war against Gulliman and his allies. Sahal's own opinion on the matter is unknown, and will likely remain so for all time, for as the Night Lords were fighting the Salamanders aboard the Chalice, a new player appeared in the space battle. A fleet of Eldar vessels emerged from the webway surrounding the Chalice. The Xenos ships took heavy damage from the forged ship's escorts, but they ignored their losses, focusing on allowing a few ships from reaching their allotted position around the chalice. Once these ships were in alignment, so just as the Sahal was confronting Takel on the chalice's bridge, the Eldar used their strange sorcery and ancient technology to banish the forge ship and its contents into the warp, sealing it away in a stasis bubble of prodigious size. The Eldar vessel then promptly departed, as, it did, as did the survivors of the Night Lord's ships, carrying word of the strange battle back to the Loyalists. Eventually, Sahal and many other warriors had been lost. Sevatar deemed the attack a success. The Chalice of Fire was never seen again, and the threat of Vulcan's artifacts appeared to have been removed from the equation of civil war. Great was the rage of Vulcan when he learned of the fate of his forge ship, and the loss of his weapons. He vowed the Eldar would pay for their treachery, and over millennia since, he has made good on the promise several times, sending warbands to, war to attack the Exodite planets and even craft worlds, and uh, allying with the Blood Angels on several occasions. Still, the children of Isha remain confident that they did the right thing. The artifacts forged by the Black Dragon in the time he was still fresh and flesh and blood were far too dangerous to be left in the hands of monkeys. Yes, I said monkeys. Monkeys. Sounds kind of weird. Yet the question remains. The Chalice of Fire was not destroyed, merely sealed away. 
Even now, there are many Forge Fathers and other Chaos Lords who seek to break its prison and bring it back to the Materium, so that they might plunder its contents. Some factions among the Mechanicos that are aware of the Forge Ship's legend are also hungry for the lost lore it contains. Convinced that since it was sealed before the Salamanders succumbed to the Lord of Chaos, all its treasures will rightfully belong to the Omnissiah's devoted servant. The Inquisition is ever watchful for signs of this dreaded ship's return, and its, agent and its agents know that should the Chalice reappear, they can count on the help of the Night Lord. The Sons of Nostromo are, are as eager to prevent the horrors of the, chal the to prevent the horrors the Chalice could unleash as they are to learn more about the fate of their brothers lost to its holds 10,000 years ago. Perhaps even now, in a place out of time, Sahal battles to kill still. Many among the Shatter Legions sought vengeance against the Primarchs who had personally led the slaughter of their brothers, and none more so than the Night Lords against Vulcan. Many pilots were hatched many plots were hatched to eliminate the Black Dragon, only to be aborted when the realization sunk in that none of them had the means to prevent Vulcan's unholy resurrection. That is, none of them until the chief librarian of the Eighth Legion, the Terran-born Fel Zaharost, was, contact was contacted by a man calling himself John Grammaticus. Grammaticus was a perpetual, something he proved to the librarian by allowing himself to be killed in front of him. Painful as the process was, it, along with the Twentieth Legion medallion founding, found in Grammaticus' position, convinced Zaharost to listen to what this immortal had to say. The tale he received is preserved in the arc that yeah, in the archives of the Night Lords as well as those of the Inquisition, who received the copy soon after his founding. According to Grammaticus, he had once been in the employ of a group of Xenos from various species, interested in manipulating the human race to their own ends. Their enemy was a primordial annihilator the dark forces in the world that had corrupted and empowered Gulliman and his associates. But this cabal, as it called itself, was no ally of the Imperium. It wanted the traitors to win so that Gulliman would eventually destroy mankind, taking the primordial annihilator along with it. Grammaticus' desertion was, he said, a tale for another time, for he brought knowledge far more important to Zarahost's immediate needs, a means to kill Vulcan permanently. Before the barting the Cabal, John had learned of an artifact called the Fulgurite Spear, a weapon made of, psychic, of the psychic remnants of the Emperor's own power. Lost and forgotten on an isolated world decades ago, this weapon had been prophesied by one of the Eldar Seers to be able to end the life of the Black Dragon. Grammaticus claimed that all of the traitor Primarchs, Vol that of all the traitor Primarchs, Vulcan was somehow the most dangerous, and that if he were not stopped, he would, in time, become the most terrible threat to all sentient life in the galaxy. Zarhos needed little convincing to go after the Fulgurite, his own hatred for the fallen Lord of Drakes making all the considerations second, making all other considerations secondary, excuse me. The Fulgurite rested on the world of Tras... I was about to say Tarsonis, but it's uh, Traorsis. According to local legends, the Emperor had traveled to this world long before he had revealed himself on Terra and began the Wars of Unification. There he battled a covenant of demons, sorcerers, and their minions. Such had been the power unleashed there that the Fulgrai Spear had formed from the remaining energies of the Master of Mankind's Psychic Lightning. The relic had been recovered by an illegal and secret cult of the, em of the Emperor as a god, enshrined and preserved for decades. The Dark Gods, however, were also aware of the Fulgurite and the threat it represented to their minions. For a relic from the Emperor, for as a relic from the Emperor, it was anathema to all creatures of chaos. They had told their devotees among the trio legions of the weapon, resting on Triorsis, and when Grammaticus and Zarhost arrived on the planet, it was already occupied by the Dark Angel's forces. The population had been either exterminated, sacrificed in dark rituals to the changers of ways, or shipped off-world to the nightmarish laboratories of the First Legion and that they have hidden in the ghoul stars. Yet, 
the First Legion was still present, searching for the Fulgurite. The last act of resistance of Traorsi's people had been to hide your sac sacred relic. Together with a small group of Night Lords, Grammaticus and Zarhost infiltrated the Dark Angel's lines, using the powers of the Chief Librarian in combination with the Perpetual's own strange psychic powers. After a brief battle with the Dark Angel Sorcerer leading the traitors on Traorsis, they managed to recover the Fulgurai Spear and escape. Immediately, Zargos began to prepare a way for them to get to Vulcan. Not an easy task, even for the 8th Legion. The Night Lords were too scattered for a full front assault, and the Chief Librarian was unwilling to gamble the lives of his brothers on what was, after all, only the word, the word of one human with a strange ability. Even Grammaticus agreed that a direct attack was likely to fall, as Vulcan was leading the core, uh, core group of the 18th Legion. Cunning, he said, would be their best chance at succeeding. Using the secret knowledge gleaned during his time as an agent of the Cabal, oh. Grammaticus and fellow Zarahos infiltrated the Salamander's flagship, the Flame Rot. The two of them went there alone for to keep themselves hidden from the perception would require all of their combined efforts. We do not know the exact details of what happened, for John Grammaticus was never seen again, and the headless corpse of the chief librarian was displayed as a standard by the salamanders when they fought against the 8th legion. We know, however, that Grammaticus managed to reach Vulcan and hurt him with a fulgurite. While Vulcan survived the attack, he was still wounded, and the damage did not heal as it should have. Unsure of what the consequences would be, should he die again, while the Fulgurite wound was still on his flesh, Vulcan was forced to turn the was was forced to turn towards the dark arts his brothers had so fully embraced. A grand ritual was performed. The cost of lives of thousands of sacrifices and shattered the sanity of dozens of librarians, turning them into full fledged sorcerers. Through it, Vulcan was able to contact the Dark Gods themselves and have them heal the damage inflicted upon him by John Grammaticus. But the ruinous powers never gave give anything without hidden costs, and Vulcan's soul was forever tainted by the ritual. With his every night haunted by visions of horror and corruption, as the Chaos Gods each attempted to draw him to their service. How long had it been? Vulcan wondered. Since, his la since, since he had last truly felt pain. When he had fought against curse, he had died many times, but none of those deaths had felt as painful as the pulsing agony in his flank. Every wound he had suffered then had quickly been healed when he had resurrected, for the King of Night had been trying to kill him quickly, not make him suffer. Another proof of his weakness. The Black Dragons... Oh, the Black Dragon was still furious that one of his would-be assassins had managed to escape. He had slain the Night Lord Librarian, cutting his head off his name with the nameless blade he had forged after abandoning Dawnstar. But the accursed human, the one who had actually carried this damned spear point, had fled before he could catch him. One of his sons had been sure that he had shot the man, but there had been no body when they had reached the location of the supposed death though there was quite a lot of blood, too much for one mortal to lose without dying. This brought dark possibilities to the mind, of Vol to the mind for Vulcan, but he disregarded them for he had more pressing concerns. He was still standing in the middle of what had once been a prosperous high city, but was now little more than a graveyard, hunted by the tormented ghosts of its former inhabitants. Millions had been sacrificed and patterns gleaned from the occult lore Vulcan had accumulated in his search for answers and from the other renegade legions. Around him stood a million wait around him stood a, mi a circle of uh, 144 librarians, their lips silently moving as they mentally recited incantations of Vulcan's own design. Based on the scrolls plundered from the vaults of a Xenos species, he had personally all but exterminated. A few had escaped him, but regardless of what lord he had managed to flee with, Vulcan was confident that the Sauruti would never again be a threat to mankind. The air shimmer would barely contain power. Then a crack appeared in the very fabric of the universe. 
then spread until reality shattered and the layer behind the materium was revealed. Vulcan looked right into it, and as the incantations continued, now shouted loudly, in voices that seemed to be more than a little, than a little hysterical, shapes began to form in the roaring maelstrom. Four gray silhouettes that were actually one, that were actually a trillion trillion souls, scattered across the entire galaxy, looking down at Vulcan with eyes filled with the malevolence of the universe. At that moment, Vulcan understood the true nature of chaos. He saw what Gulliman had seen in the Eye of Terror. The power of the Primordial Annihilator and its connection with every human who had ever lived or would ever live. He saw the true nature of mankind looking at him through the mask of the ruinous powers. They are us, he thought, cold horror flinging his mind at the dawning revelation. These gods. They are us. He felt his sanity tremble, and for a moment he tethered on the brink of the abyss of madness, about to fall and embrace the worship of chaos, as so many had before him. Countless souls had come to this revelation before him, each broken and reforged into a weapon of the dark gods. Before the knowledge that an, e that an evil of such scope existed, that it, wait, that it came from and rested into the depths of the human soul, scholars, philosophers, savants, and psychers had all been consumed by madness. But not him. As a black dragon was confronted with his own insignificance in the grand scheme of things, he did not weep, nor did he break. I am no one's slave. He growled, clinging to his own identity and desires. I will not serve. I will not kneel. Never. The only reply from the storm of ruin was a terrible laughter, filled with a dreadful insurgent, indulgence and the inevitability of damnation. I call upon the, all the powers of the beyond, Vulcan shouted, at the very face of insanity. The price has been played, paid in blood and souls. Heal me from this curse and restore my full might. The entities around, above, beneath, and within him laughed even louder and reached out. Soon after the assassination attempt, Vulcan turned his eyes towards a distant planet and the Segmentum Tempestus. This world had nothing of worth about it, save that it had served as a staging ground for the Great Crusade and likely contained the resources left behind by, ma by the many forces that had used it over the decade. It was known as the Talaran, as Talaran, whatever, and in the nightmarish visions sent by the dark gods to torment him, Vulcan had learned a secret that the ruinous powers had likely attempted to keep a secret from him. Beneath the surface of Talaran was buried an artifact of prodigious dark power. One that in the right hands could be used to defeat the dark gods themselves. The curse of Anglamar, Alganar, Alganar. One of the three gateways to the, of the gods. This war vortex could grant those strong enough to master it, few as they were in the galaxy, control over the energies of the Imperium and the dominion of it over its denizens. The salamanders came to Talaran in force and the war began with a viral bombing of the entire planet. Vogan had no desire to waste time by prosecuting, by prosecuting a traditional war. He had come to Talaran for one re reason only, and the world's resources and inhabitants played no part in it. Some of the people of Talaran were able to shelter in the great sealed vault that had been used to store the equipment left behind by the Great Crusade, but the environment was ravaged, a once verdant world transformed into a desert of radioactive sandstorms. The salamanders' reliance or resilience to radiation allowed them to walk on the surface while only wearing power armor. But for the human survivors, survivors travel was only possible in armored vehicles, and even then only for a short period of time. Fortunately, the vaults held plenty of tanks in various states of repair and soon the Talaran rose once more, determined to avenge their world. Thousands of tanks rolled towards the traitor's position, and despite the clouds of dust, they were visible from orbit long enough before making contact that the salamanders had time to prepare. 
Still, Vulcan had not anticipated such resistance. He had believed that only a handful of terrified civilians dwelled in the vault. The Battle of Taran began as a gigantic clash of tanks amidst the ashes of the world, and things only escalated from here. The loyalists of Taran managed to send an astropathic call, and soon reinforcements from both sides poured in onto Taran. The soldiers of the Emperor came to Taran. The soldiers of the Emperor that who came to Taran did not know why the planet was so important. All that matter was that the traitors wanted it enough for a Primarch to direct operations, and therefore it must be denied to them. Imperial army regiments, knights, and even titans were deployed. The skies above Tauron were filled with the light, with light for the first time, since the bombardment, as the brilliance of the orbital batter, battles pierced the dust cloud. Even warbands from other traitor legions arrived, drawn by the promise of glorious battle. Groups from the White Scars, Space Wolves, and Imperial Fists were welcomed by Vulcan, but kept away from his real reason for being on Tauron. For months, he, the battle raged on. Eventually, however, the Loyalists started to gain ground, thanks to a few devices. De de a few deceive operations of infiltrations and sabotage, sabotage by the Alpha Legion that led to a final deci deci decisive engagement. According to the surviving accounts, almost a million tanks and other heavy vehicles were involved in the last confrontation. Though the countless acts of heroism and self-sacrifice through, you know, Asha, the Loyalists won the day, taking heavy casualties but still able to continue their advance towards Vulcan's fortress. Though he still had, a thousand, had thousands of legionaries at his disposal, fighting Tax and Titans with the Starties was a foolish notion. And so, at long last, Vulcan was forced off the planet by the combined power of the Loyalist forces, forced to abandon the ongoing excavation of the curse. The War of Talaran was over, but the planet would not know peace for long. Years after the end of the heresy, the ancient evil buried beneath its surface was finally unearthed. This was done not by the hands of the traitors, by, by, but by unaware miners, and the price paid in blood was terrible, though the threat was stopped in the end. This conflict, known as the Kurus War, and uh, what few archives are allowed to are allowed to speak of it, would also see the Imperium forced to ally with the Eldars in order to stop an evil born of the oldest follies of the ancient Xenos race. As the Salamander's fleet departed, an astropathic call came from Gulliman, spore to the warp storms by the fell sorceries of the Thirteen Legion. After years of painstakingly advance, the Ultramarines and Iron Hands are carved the path to Terra Open. The Arch Traitor was preparing for the final assault on the throne world, and he was calling all of his brothers in treachery to his side. Fuming with the stings of defeat and the knowledge that the power buried beneath the surface of Talran would never be his, for he knew that the Dark Gods would never allow him a second chance at securing something that could make him a threat to them, Vulcan ordered his fleet to begin the journey to Terra. He would yet see the Imperium fall, and reborn again in a new, strong, immortal form. Cold and darkness had held him for so long, that when they receded at last, it took him a moment to realize that he wasn't dead. It took him even longer to remember what had happened, and when he did, he wished he had not. Xavan, captain of the 34th Company of Salamanders, remembered the, num the numbness he had felt when the transmission had reached his ship. During the journey to Ishvan, he remembered the horror that had, sp that had soaked his soul as he understood its implications. He remembered that the, bur the burning hatred and fury that had driven him on the very edge of insanity. Then he remembered the betrayal among his own men, and how they had fought one another in the corridors of the ship, torn between those who were willing to follow their Primarch's every order, and those who refused to abide his madness. Zavan remembered marching down the shadowed iron tunnels, stalking his own kind like a beast of Nocturnian legends. He remembered the smell of his brother's blood as he killed him, remembered the fear and terror of the crew, of the crew members who had looked upon him and the warp core, 
the shrieks of alarm, the ships dropping out of the Imperium with such violence that he had fallen apart. The infinite blackness of space spread all around him as he floated helplessly, trapped in his sealed armor, condemned to watch the power and oxygen level steadily dropping. He forced his eyes open and saw a figure standing before him. His vision was blurry, but he recognized the silhouette of another Astartes. Though he did not know the colors he wore, wait, gray, but not like that worn by the ward bearers, this warrior's armor shone with a light that only partially belonged to the material universe. In the, crimson's eye, in the crimson eyes of Xavind, it seemed that the armor was imbued with some otherworldly light that suited the torment of his soul. Who? His voice croaked out of his throat, and the pain of speaking was like tearing his vocal cords apart. Who are you? My name is Alexis Polus, loyal servant of the Emperor. I have come to bring you home. The Siege of Terra And while the arch traitor marched his legions to confront the father he had betrayed, the Lord of Drakes led his sons against the noble houses of Terra, living naught but ruin in his wake. With fire and hatred they came, burning all that stood in their path to ashes, and drenching Terra's soil with the blood of heroes. And they cast down the doors of mankind's ancestral home, seeking to plunder her treasures for themselves, heedless of the destruction they left in their wake. Excerpt from the Canticle of the Dead While most Imperial records of the Siege of Terra on the bat focus on the battle raging around and within the Imperium Palace, Imperial Palace, the siege was actually waged all across the surface of the throne world. Though Perturabo had focused all resources and forces at his disposal in the palace, there were still hive cities housing billions spread all over the planet, defended by the pri private armies of these cities' rulers. When the traitor fleets reached Terra's orbit, Gulliman tasked the Salamander with the suppression of these remaining armies, so that once he had slain the Emperor, their lords would kneel to him and acknowledge him as the new master of mankind. But there was one army that Gulliman knew would, ser would never serve him, and needed to be destroyed. The Legion of Heroes would... The legion of heroes that would come to be known as Dragon's Bane. During the heresy, refugees from the entire Imperium flocked to Terra by the billions, fleeing the horrors inflicted by the traitor legions upon invaded populations. After being vetted by the Iron Warriors and Custodians, a process that sometimes took months, these refugees were allowed to set foot on the throne world. However, for security reasons, the bulk of them were sent away from the Imperial Palace and onto the lands of Merkia. Merica, excuse me. The Lords of Merican's uh, hive, the Lords of Merican's hive stretched their resources to lim to limit to accommodate this this sudden increase in population, and the flow of supplies from out system increased to match. Over the years, these people integrated themselves into the hives, and when it came, and when it became obvious that the war would come to Terra eventually, many volunteered to fight for their new homeworld. Several American noble families, fiercely loyal to the throne, nearly bankrupted themselves to arm, equip, and train millions of these volunteers, making them a true military force, no inferior to those of the Imperial Army. Driven by the loss of their birth world and desire to protect their families, these men and women trained day and night without complaint. Fears of traitors, spies, and cultists infiltrating the refugees were laid to rest by the Thousand Sons, who ruthlessly purged such elements, foiling the plot of the Arch Traitor to use these poor souls in order to seed confusion and paranoia at the heart of the Imperium. Of all the Loyalist forces on Terra, not already in the palace, Gulliman feared this army the most, for they had both the means and will to attack his forces from behind while he was laying siege to the palace. He asked that Vulcan himself ensure that they were taken out of the equation, by any means necessary. And so, led by the dra Black Dragon himself, the primary force of the Salamanders descended upon Merkia. But Vulcan had underestimated the amount of resolve an aug unaugmented human can bring to bear with his back to the wall and his family in danger. What was later called the Battle of Dragon's Bane was a slaughter. Millions of human soldiers fought and died heroically against the forces of the 18th Legion. 
For months, they resisted, giving their lives to hold back the tide of transhuman warriors. Ironically, the nobles who had not spent their wealth to assist and arm the refugees were the first to fall, their private armies crushed by the salamanders, hungry for the plunder of other treasure rooms, which, while still full, would not save their lives. Meanwhile, the estates of those who had risked their family's fortune to aid others were defended until death. This battle, where common humans held back the power of nearly an entire space marine legion, is celebrated to this day, with grand monuments built upon the location of the most important engagements. Many of today's prominent citizens of Merkia are descendants from one of those heroes of this desperate battle. While they were ultimately defeated, the soldiers of Dragon's Bane saved the lives of their kin, for no sooner had he finally succeeded in breaking the army, Vulcan's attention turned towards the Imperial Palace. His forces had already pillaged the only vaults of Merkia that still hold any wealth, and the Black Dragon was unwilling to be denied the glory of the final battle, as well as his share of the treasure within the palace. There are some theories that Perturabo deliberately engineered the whole thing to ease the pressure on the palace, personally discussing with the American lords and convincing them to bankroll the creation of the refugee army. While there is little evidence, none of which convincing, it is enough to increase the distrust of Terrans for the 4th Legion a little more. Despite the battle's name, the Salamanders' losses weren't very high at Dragon's Bane, thanks to their superior, to, to their superior endurance. However, it is still a source of shame to the 18th Legion, and they do all they can to keep it a secret, especially from their own slaves. For should these unfortunate souls learn that their demigod masters aren't as invincible as they claim to be, their hold over them would be quick to shatter. While there are some order to the salamander, while there are there was some order to the salamander suppression of any potential second front across Terra, the battle for the Imperial Palace was, on the traitor side, a barely controlled chaos. The Blood Angels were rampaging uh, the cities of the Imperial Palace of the Imperial World, feeding their unholy appetite upon the defenseless population. The White Scars and Space Wolves, lacking the unifying presence of their Primarch, fought in displaced packs, attaching themselves to other forces or launching daring raids on their own, which were quickly crushed by loyalist counterattacks. As the madness of chaos strengthened its grips over the nine traitor legions, Vulcan himself began to lose control of his sons, as well as his own desires. Instead of pursuing tactical objectives, the salamanders turned their eyes on the vaults of the Imperial Palace, where the relics of mankind's earlier ages and treasures from all over the galaxy were stored. Some of Vulcan's sons were disillusioned, mocking the artifacts surrounding them as junk, seeing little value in it. No gold, no gemstones, only antique trink trinkets from ages long forgotten. But the Lord of Drakes recognized both the artistry, 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 okay, whatever, the artistry, call it whatever you want, of the items gathered here and the subtle power of their historical significance. Here were the relics that for all their apparent lack of immediate value were tied tightly to mankind's very nature. Each marked a step, an accomplishment of a fleeging species on the long and torturous path that had led it to galactic supremacy. There was a portrait of a woman with the most mysterious smile and steel covered in three different alphabets, the characters barely visible after ten thousands of years. A painting of a yellow flower hanged in stasis in the stasis fields, and dozens of I other items were similarly preserved. Surrounded by these items of mankind's ancestral past, Vulcan felt at peace. The ravenous hunger that had been burning his breast ever since he had made that ill-fated deal with the Empyrean in order to recover from the assassination attempt had ceased to torment him. Then that peace was shattered. My lord, said Arteros, suddenly, breaking Vulcan's contemplation. The commander of the Pyrogar was gesturing at his vox. Listen. Repressing a violent response to his equerry's disturbance, Vulcan shifted his vox frequency and listened into the announcement, just in time to catch the last words. We have come for you. A cold feeling 
that was very much like uh, doubt spread through his gut. He knew those words, and he knew the voice speaking them, distorted and uglier though it may be. But it was impossible that he be here. Gulliman had told him of his schemes, of the schemes their war-born allies had engineered to ensure that he was unable to interfere. Yet, it was impossible. It was confirmed, my lord," shouted Arterus. "The third and eighth have arrived. Lord Gulliman demands that we hold them back while the Lord, while Lord Korax fights them in orbit. He and the other push, uh, other push in for the final assault." Vulcan cursed silently and looked around one last time. So many treasures, so much knowledge, so much power. The kind of power his siblings would either fall to notice, or in the case of those who had fully succumbed to the attraction of the ruinous power, would seek to destroy in order to pur plunge mankind further into ignorant worship of these primordial entities. He would not allow such a thing. Gulliman and him, as well as the others who still clung to their sanity, would lead mankind to greatness under their rule, not reduce it to barbarism and madness. Order would come from their strength, whatever the will of the self-proclaimed dark gods. So had Gulliman promised him. Leave them, he ordered his men as he turned back the way he had come, out of the Sigilites' private quarters and back to the field outside the palace. Touch nothing. We will return here once our work outside is done, and before anyone else gets here. It is said that when the Night Lords and Emperor's children arrived and Sanguinius was destroyed, Vulcan was marching through the private collection of the Sigilite, looking for relics from old earth, with eyes burning with greed. He immediately left the palace, taking some of the priceless artifacts with him, now irredeemably tainted by the touch of, warp, of the warp, and prepared his forces to face the third and eighth legions, the reinforcements on the surface of Terra. He believed that the Night Lords would stop at nothing at nothing to get a chance at him, and look forward to sending them to meet their Primarch in the afterlife. He was wrong. Sevatar's hold on his brothers was strong, forged during the heresy by regular strikes of genius and inspiration that had saved the legion several times and brought them to the siege in time to play a part in the last stage of the war. The Night Lords remained focused on their task, saving countless civilians from the Blood Angels while Vulcan uselessly awaited their charge. Eventually, the Sandalmanders abandoned their defensive position and attacked the Night Lords themselves. But the Sons of Nostramo had the edge in urban warfare, and the ruins of Terra cities proved a suitable killing ground for them. While not too many Salamanders were slain before the siege came to an end, virtually no Night Lords were lost, save for those unfortunate enough to face the Black Dragon himself. Because of this, Gulliman was forced, forced to launch his assault on the Cavea Ferrum without the support of the Black Dragon, whose presence would certainly have made things turn out much differently. When the arch traitor fell out of the Emperor's hand, Vulcan was among the first traitor Primarchs to order his legion to run. In the eyes of the Black Dragon, he had fulfilled his part in the siege the moment Dragon's Bane had ended. Gulliman had proved unworthy when he had fall failed in his. Whatever the future would bring, Vulcan refused to face it as an animal cage by his brothers once they realized they could not execute him. His fleet left Terra united under his leadership, and it would prove to be one of the most dangerous threats to the Imperium yet. Post-Heresy The Dragon Ascended In the fires of war, greater than any before he rises, reborn, a creature not of emotion but of dark desire, fell ambition, waiting for the day he claims to the, to the first and last blade, and becomes the one and becomes the one even the gods shall feel, shall fear, attributed to broken devotee. The demise of Gulliman did not single, signal the end of the war for Vulcan. It only changed how he chose to prosecute it. The driver, for, the driver for conquest that had inhabited the salamanders during the heresy vanished. Rebraced by a level of greed no one would have thought a Primarch in his legion could be capable of. The 18th legion come together, the 18th legion come together again under Vulcan's command for the siege of Terra, rampaged across the galaxy, plundering world, hundreds of worlds in fact, like an unstoppable force of nature. 
Edivanas' fleet's hold were filled with treasure, Vulcan's greed was not satisfied. A deep hunger had formed at the core of his being, born of the emptiness that had come in the wake of Gulliman's death and the loss of Vulcan's purpose. Destiny is the justification of tyrants and the excuse of fools. Ancient Terran Proverb As a black dragon committed atrocity after atrocity, the void began to fill with the energies of the warp. No single dark god bestowed his twisted blessings upon Vulcan. The hollowness of his spirit simply called to the flows of the Sea of Souls. Vulcan's powers grew, and at long last he found a new purpose. To become something more than even his father had planned. To shed the last part of himself that remained human, and become a true immortal, freed from the limitation his current body imposed upon him. At this point, Leno Johnson and Sanguinius had both already became, become demon princes, primarchs, excuse me, and Vulcan intended to follow their example. Except that he did not intend to bend the knee to any of the four. So began the War of the Dragon, fueled by Vulcan's renewed ambition. The Salamanders slowed their wild course across the galaxy, letting the Imperial Pursuit catch up to them. As could have been expected, the Night Lords were leading the charge, burning with a desire to avenge their murdered Con the murder of Conrad Kurz. But the thought, but though the Night Lords and their allies outnumbered the Salamanders, who had lost almost all, who had lost almost all of their human supporters during the Siege of Terra, and the desperate flight from it, it was it was part of the Black Dragon's plan. Vulcan had learned from the Siege of Terra that his mere presence would not be enough to go the Night Lords into reckless action. And so he had designed another, another way. At his command, thousands of astropaths were tortured, while made to watch the, re watch the relics Vulcan had stolen from his brother's corpses on Ishvan V. The relic's image uh, was broadcasted into the warp, where it was picked up by the Night Lords, navigators, astropaths, and librarians. Immediately, Sivatar, Legion Master of the Night Lords, and heir of Conrad Kurz, lost control of his brothers. The, Nostramo war the Nostraman warriors abandoned the Prince of Crows' carefully designed plan of attack and launched themselves into direct and massed assault. All across the Salamander's territory, thousands of Night Lords died at the hands of the sons of Vulcan while the sorcerers of the 18th Legion performed a grand ritual at their Primarch's behest. The exact details of the spell have long since been lost to time, if they were ever recorded in Imperial archives. But the end result was clear. In the fortress of Scythe Cluster, in the Scythe Cluster, Vulcan shed his body of flesh and became a demon Primarch. He could hear them all. Billions of voices, crying out in fear and worship of him. Across the galaxy, they knew his name. He was terror, and power incarnate to those weaklings. For more than the shadows of his dead brother, far more than the shadows of his dead brother, he was the one they feared now, that their false god had descended to his golden throne. He drank deep of their fear, feeling its strength. He reached out across the stars and sensed the carnage his sons were wrecking in his name the fury and helplessness of Kurz's sons as they rushed into his trap, spurred on by the thirst for revenge. He laughed, and the sound of his laughter would echo across the Sea of Souls and drive psychers mad for ten thousand years. The souls of the fallen Night Lords cried out as he captured them and burned them out, reducing these noble warriors to nothing more than fuel for his own ambition. His body twisted and cracked, his immortality struggling against the transformation taking hold. He focused all of his will to mastering the power that had returned to him, that had returned him to life so many times, bending it into unnatural patterns, forcing it to work alongside the empiric energies rather than against them, in an, in an unholy union that perverted everything his father had ever intended. His body grew and grew, swollen with the fear and death and plunder. His armor burst to pieces as his skin was covered in scales, and two immense wings erupted from his back. His sword shattered in a hundred fragments that flew across the air, each embedding itself into the, fresh, into the flesh of a different sacrifice. Whatever little remained of Vulcan's humanity was lost, and the black dragon opened his eyes and looked down at the dead world with burning red eyes, 
seeing the tiny green armored beings before him as sparks of light in the infinite black. He opened his mouth, which was now a jaw that could swallow tanks, and roared his might at the face of the universe. The rise of Vulcan sent ripples across the Sea of Souls, causing cults to appear on dozens of worlds and demonic incursions to tear through reality's veil on several. The Imperium was forced to send more forces to deal with the situation, while the Night Lords themselves were reinforced by allies of, their of the highest caliber, the Sons of Horus, led by, now legendary, led by the now legendary Morneval. At the time, the Salamanders, instead of being bolstered by their Primarch's new terrible power, were instead shaken as the command chain was suddenly thrown into chaos. Vulcan's mind had undergone a transformation as drastic as his body, though philosophers would argue that in both cases his true nature had simply been revealed. He was still struggling with his new existence, and was unable to properly lead his legion, even as the Imperium struck back at it with all its strength. With the help of the Sons of Horus, Sevatar was able to turn the situation, and finally confronted Vulcan in the ruins of Sartine Prime, once a populous hive world whose people had been sacrificed to fuel the extension of the Salamander's Primarch. There, amidst the bones of billions of dead, the Prince of Crows and the Mornival faced the Black Dragon. The details of this confrontation are long lost, but it is known that both Servitar and the four members of the Mornival survived, while Vulcan fled through the Sea of Souls, abandoning his sons to the Imperium's retribution. The War of the Dragon was over, and though the Imperium had ultimately been victorious, it had lost much, whilst, while a known enemy of mankind became much more powerful. He looked upon them for the first time since Gulliman had died. He knew certainty. He knew uncertainty. Oh, he knew uncertainty. There were thousands of them, charging across the ruins his, son had, his sons had made of this world. But only six deserved his attention. Only six truly threatened him. The soul fire is burning bright across the battlefield. Four came together, fighting as one as they crashed through the ranks of his sons like a tidal wave. Two carried the weapons that had broken his brother, the Maul and the Talon. The two weapons shone with light that burned his eyes, even from a great distance. They could hurt him, he knew, perhaps even kill him. Was he truly immortal now? Has his gift endured the transformation? And if it, even if it had, did it have the power to save him from the weapons such as from weapons such as these? He knew that those like him could be destroyed by weapons imbued with particular power. Several such web tools of death had been aboard the, cha the chalice of fire before it had been stolen from him. Then there were the two others, the sons of the king of night. One was shining with the light of power long denied now embraced in full, and moved like a meteor striking too quick for his sons to even stand a chance to stop him. And the last one... The last one was cloaked in shadows, too deep even for his sight to penetrate, and all that radiated from him was vengeance and the cold promise of death. The six came down on him in a circle, and for the first time since his best beast mother had killed him hundreds of years ago, Vulcan knew fear. He had gone too far, sacrificed too much to be stopped now. With a roar, he gathered his power and tore through the veil of space before plunging into the rift. His sons, clo clos closest to him, rushed in to follow him, exposing themselves to the raw madness of the warp in order to remain with their Primarch. As he fled from Sartine, Vulcan convinced himself that there had been no reason to remain there. He had achieved his goal and claimed the power that was rightfully his. Now he sensed another opportunity in the distance, something that would allow him to finish the war and claim the throne Gulliman had failed to seize. The Black Dragon did not see the Shadow Knight who entered the rift behind him just before it closed. He did not see the lone warrior who stalked him across the Sea of Souls. Shades and echoes gathered around him, driven forward by the promise of vengeance. The hunt would last many hundreds of years, but eventually, the Soul Hunter and the Black Dragon would meet again, and judgment would come at last. 
Soon after the War of the Dragon, the Night Lords destroyed Nocturne, using cyclonic torpedoes to literally tear the entire planet to shreds. Prometheus, the planet's moon, crashed into the surface of Nocturne during the upheaval, and fragments of both celestial bodies still form an asteroid belt in the system this day. It was hoped that this act would draw Vulcan out of hiding and make him confront the Night Lords to avenge his destroyed homeworld. But the Black Dragon had long since left Nocturne behind him, and just as the volcanic planet burst into fragments, he instead emerged from the warp in the Pandorak system. Excuse me, in the Pandorak system, on the thrice cursed world of Pythos. A legion of demons walked in his wake, as well as a handful of salamanders, reforged to the fires of the Imperium in, into second born, possessed marines of immense power. Before him stood the Death Guards and the Thousand Sons, each led by their Primarch, as well as many Imperial regiments. They had come to Pythos to seal a warp rift of immense size to which hordes of Neverborn were pouring into real space. Volk and his followers passed through the rifts as Magnus was gathering his power to close it. It is unknown whether Vulcan knew of Pythos' rift when he fled Sartine, Crytine, whatever that's called, or if he was lost in the warp and was guided by the Dark Gods to the portal, and seized the opportunity it presented. Had Vulcan triumphed on Pythos, he would have been able to open a new front against the Imperium, and perhaps even win the war that Gulliman had started. But first, the Black Dragon had to face one of his brothers for the second time. Okay, let's begin. The fight between Mortarion and Vulcan is the stuff of legends, and recorded into the archives of the Inquisition and the 14th and 15th legions alike. It is written that though Vulcan towered above the Death Lord in his new infernal form, Mortarion was undaunted and faced his fallen brother head on, wielding the sight with which he had cleansed this, his world of the Witch Lords. This weapon was the bane of all those corrupted by the warp, and Vulcan was no exception. But Mortarion was weary and wounded, brought near to the near the end of mm, his nearly infinite endurance by the days of fighting through the jungles of Pythos. While Vulcan had been reinvigorated by his journey through the warp, in the end the Mortarion fell before the Black Dragon's claw, but not before inflicting a terrible wound upon Vulcan's flank. The injury was grave enough that when Magnus unleashed the spell he had been preparing during the fight between the two Primarchs, the Black Dragon was unable to resist its purifying power. Vulcan lost his hold upon his material form and was banished into the Sea of Souls, able only to scream in denial as Magnus sealed the warp rift and thwarted his dark ambitions. Vulcan defeated, Vulcan's defeat at Magnus' hands was not permanent, however. After the Black Dragon's endless resurrection on Ishvan V, the fact that he had disappeared after the Crimson Kings def defeated him had led him had led some to hope that he had been banished forever. But that was not to be. Soon the seers of the Thousand Suns saw visions of the great Drake rising from, the s from a sea of flame within the Eye of Terror. Vulcan had returned, though his flank still bore the mark of a Mortarian's sight. The sorcerers of the Salamanders also fell their Primarch's return and guided the entire legion into the Great Eye and towards their master. There, was the le there the legion was reunited, but, Vulcan knew Titan but Vulcan's new titanic aspect and terrible aura made it impossible for all but the strongest of his sons to even stand in his presence. In shedding the last of his human weaknesses, Vulcan had also lost his connection with his own sons. Now, though they feared him and worshipped him, they could no longer love him, for he was so alien to them as the dark gods themselves. Great was the rage of Vulcan, as he realized that he had lost so much more than he had prepared to sacrifice. The ground of the Legion's new demonic homeworld shook with his fury for the, for the great part of a century beyond the Eye, and the Salamanders spent most of the Legion's Legion Wars fighting for survival their master lost the tides of his insane wrath. Many sold their services to one side or the other of the war, raging in the Eye of Terror, and when the Cologne Wars erupted, they added their forces those spurring through the shattered Iron Cage. Without a Primarch to give them cohesion, however, the Salamander's war Salamander Warbands, who took advantage of Bile's insanity, were soon forced back into the Eye by the vengeful strike of the Night Lords. 
among the, the ranks of the lost and the damned, whispers circulated that the salamanders would soon be an extinct legion, left behind by a primarch who had abandoned them. Oh boy. Artelus Numenor, the broken devotee. Like most legions, the salamanders' cadre of terminators were gathered in a single brotherhood, whose members were spread across companies. In the Salamander's case, this was a group. This group was the first company, known as the Pyre Guard. During the Robutian heresy, it was led by Artelu, Artelus Numenor, the first captain of the 18th Legion, an equerry of Vulcan, a Terran legionary and one of the few survivors of the time before the Legion was reunited with its Primarch. Artelus was a powerful warrior and an inspiring leader, something of a rarity in the 18th Legion. Vulcan recognized his use when he took command and named Arterus his equerry, tasked with in interceding between the Lord of Drakes and the rest of the Imperium. Firstly, firstly dedicated to his Primarch, Arterus stood with him when he turned against the Emperor. It is rumored that he was the one responsible for the quiet purge of the Salamander's own ranks prior to the Ishvan massacre ensuring that those who would still cling to their oaths of loyalty to the Imperium would never reach their system alive. While he wasn't completely successful, his bloody-handed efforts participated in ensuring that slaughter of the loyal legions. On the Orgal Plateau, he led the Pyre Guard at the side of Vulcan, fighting against the Night Guard while Curse and Vulcan battled. He, he is said to have crossed blade with Talos, the Soul Hunter at that time and have not locked eyes with him as Vulcan killed the King of Night, and to have locked eyes with him. Artelus fought during the entire heresy at his Primarch's side, and was present at the Siege of Terra, and during the War of the Dragon. When the Salamanders were defeated and Vulcan departed through the warp, however, Artelus was unable to follow. Instead, he gathered the rest of the Legion and directed their retreat from the Eighth Legion's fury, abandoning the relics of Conrad Kurz and the hasty withdrawal. While this saved the lives of thousands of legionnaires from the vengeance of the Night Lords and the Sons of Horus alike, it would eventually cost the First Captain everything. When Vulcan's call reached the Legion, Arterus convinced several of the Legion's captains to go into the Eye of Terror. While they wanted to remain in the Imperial space and continue the raids, rather than enter the storm of madness and chaos, he single-handedly kept the Legion from falling on to pieces on the way to the demon world where Vulcan had risen. His devotion to the Lord of Drake so strong No, his devotion to the Lord of Drake strong enough to keep the very ships of the Salamanders sailing together in the storm. When at last the fleet reached the planet, he was the first mortal salamander to set foot upon it, and the first to stand before his Primarch in all his reborn infernal glory. Instead of rewarding him for his loyal services, Vulcan unleashed all his fury at his condition and the losses of Curse's relic on his faithful equerry. Artelus didn't die, but his mind was shattered by Vulcan's wrath. His faith in Vulcan, a core part of his being, was ripped away when he beheld when he beheld what the dragon, black dragon had become, and his soul was defenseless when exposed to the raw insanities of the energies that fueled the demon Primarch's body. His body and mind were twisted as parts of his soul were torn off and devoured by the Neverborn created from Vulcan's violent outburst. Despair, horror and insanity poured into the void and only a wretched shell of the once powerful commander remained in the aftermath. The fate of the one the fate of the one the Salamanders now called the Broken Devotee is thought to have played a huge part in the splintering of the 18th Legion after their arrival in the Eye of Terror. With their Primarch gone mad with rage and the only other possible leader ruined by beyond salvation, each captain took what forces he could gather and left, seeking his own fortune in the Great Eye rather than remain near Vulcan and risk being the next victim of his insane fury. As to Arterus himself, he lives still, in a fashion and wonders the eye through means unknown, but doubtlessly heretical. According to the tales among eye-based warbands, as he gained some strange arcane insight from his madness. He has gained, whatever you get it. Seen as a sign of ill luck by the Salamanders and the other traitor legions, he had nonetheless survived in some of the most hostile worlds within the Eye of Terror, 
despite being utterly unable to fight sometimes to fight. Sometimes deluded cults gather around him and follow him in his journeys, listening to his insane ramblings and writing them down, desperate to find some meaning among the madness. On many occasions, Chaos Lords have sought the broken devotee with questions of their own, and several have even received the, an answer to their queries. Eventually, however, Vulcan's rage abated, or at least cooled down. The salamanders returned to him and gave them all and, and he gave them all a single command that they go out across the galaxy and plunder its worlds, bringing back the results of their plunder to the world to this world so that they, he may claim his share as their lord and master. It is said that some salamander lords tried to refuse this decree, unwilling to part with any of their ill gotten gains. What became of them is subject of many speculations. But we do know that all current salamander warbands pay Vulcan's tithes. Vulcan also formed the Promethean Conclave to ensure the continuity of his gene line, even now that he could no longer donate genetic material to create new progenoid glands. His return from the Wrathful Madness essentially saved the salamander's region from destroying itself and the insanity of the Eye of Terror. For a second time now, Vulcan had pulled the 18 from the very brink of extinction, and an event that is now called the Reforging. When the Imperium learned of this, the legions began to prepare, convinced that another Black Crusade was on its way. But soon after re-establishing his rule over the 18th Legion, Vulcan fell back to his liturgy, spending the years laying upon his ever-growing treasure, his mind cast adrift into the tides of the warp, where he plots and schemes to gain yet more wealth and power. But the Salamanders remember his wrath well, and they all are cautious to obey his edicts, and on the rare occasion where his consciousness returns to his body, and he summons one of them to give his, him particular orders, they do all, they all do his bidding. Whenever this happens, the ripples in the Sea of Souls are large enough that they are almost always picked up by the seers of the Thousand Suns, or the psychers and astropaths stations in the Iron Cage around the Eye of Terror. Interpreting the visions, however, is another matter entirely, and hundreds of psychers have been lost to the madness, trying to decipher the Black Dragon's commands to his minions. Even the minds of his few son, even the minds of the few sons of Magnus, have been shattered by the darkness of these images, and were mournfully put down by their brothers to end their torment. Still, a lot has been learned from these sacrifices. General spe generally speaking, there are three types of quests Vulcan might send one of his sons on. Attacking a particular enemy, either to punish old offenses or to influence the balance of power in some distinct conflict, acquiring a particular item, bringing it back to Vulcan's treasure, and tracking down and killing another salamander who has committed crimes against the Legion, such as disobeying Vulcan's orders or trying to bypass the Promethean Conclave. Those receiving Vulcan's commands also receive some measure of his influence over the warp. Their journey through the Sea of Souls will be swifter and relatively safer, and if they have sorcerers under their employee or mystical abilities of their own, demons will be more open to their demands and pacts. The more recent and infamous such dark appointment that the Imperium was aware of, aware of was the one that led to the Black Crusade recorded in was the one that led to the Black Crusade recorded in Imperial archives as the Gothic War. At the dawn of the 31st millennium, 2nd century, Vulcan ordered Cassian Dracos to gather a great fleet of the lost and the damned and invade the Gothic sector. Dracos was a Chaos Dreadnought who had retained his sanity since the days of the Robotian heresy, and was even more ancient than that, having led the 18 legions in the days before Vulcan was found. While Cassian was appointed as the leader of the Black Crusade, the Black Dragon had laid the seeds of heresy and ruin in the Gothic sector beforehand. At his signal, cast across the Sea of Souls, rebellious er rebellions erupted all across the sector as the disciples of the dragons revealed their treachery. Entire battle, battle groups of the battle fleet Gothica turned traitors and planets fell to civil war as loyalists struggled against those who had embraced the lies of the dragon. Meanwhile, the warp itself erupted in storms of rare violence, isolating the sector from reinforcements. For several years, it was all the sector command could do to keep this rage of region of imperial space from simply falling apart. 
Lord Admiral Cornelius von Ravensburg directed the forces under his command to assist the Imperial war worlds and stop rebellious battle groups. But his resources were spread thin, and then the Salamanders, the architects behind the walls of the Gothic se sector, arrived. Their fleet had taken long and secret paths through the warp to bypass the Iron Cage, losing dozens of vessels on their way. But these losses mattered nothing to Cassian, who was, who was spurred forward by Vulcan's command and the fear of his wrath should he fail. The mission Vulcan had given to the Revenant, as Cassian was known among his legion, was to acquire the legendary Blackstone Fortress. Six of these massive ancient starships of unknown, probably alien origin, were scattered across the Gothic sector, used by the Imperial Navy as bases though their true function and capabilities were as unknown as their origins. The Adeptus Mechanicus had refitted each of the Blackstone fortresses with massive weaponry and life support to turn them into orbital fortresses of a scale and power rarely seen in the Imperium. Cassian's flagship in the Gothic War was the Ebon Drake, a hideous vessel born in the infernal forges of the Eye of Terror. More than a dozen different forge fathers had worked on its designs and constructions, and it carried with it, w within it weapons capable of ripping an entire worlds apart, which led to Imperial forces naming it Planet Killer. Several warbands of the Salamanders had joined Cassian's crusade, as had hundreds of pirates and raider vessels. Worse still, Cassian had the personal knowledge of the Gothic sector, having been part of the traitor forces that had conquered Port Ma for Gulliman's side during the Robutian heresy, ten millennia ago. The traitors outnumbered and outgunned battle fleet Gothic, but the servants of the Imperium had something their enemies did not. Courage, discipline, and faith in the God Emperor. Despite these advantages, the Imperium suffered greatly in the first years of the war, Entire systems were lost, their population slaughtered or enslaved. It was later discovered that their first massive invasion was intended as a cover for Cassian's true goal. In order to awaken the full power of the Blackstone Fortress and control them, the Chaos Lord needed two relics held on Imperial worlds, the Hand of Darkness and the Eye of Night. The Ebon Drake led Chaos forces in raids upon the, upon the two planets that held these artifacts. Purgatory and Orn's world. Both of these planets were left by the salamanders as lifeless husks in order to hide their tracks. But this unusual behavior instead led the Inquisitor Horst, responsible for investigating the schemes of chaos in the Gothic sector, to finally uncover the Black Crusade's true purpose. Despite several attempts by Horst and his agents at reclaiming the relics from the traitor's hands, Cassian was able to activate and control one of the Blackstone fortresses. He used it along the rest of his forces to devastating effect on the cardinal world of Savavin, Savavin, combining their power in order to reduce the massive defensive fleet to slag before the Ebon Drake unleashed its full contempt of weapons upon the planet, shattering it to pieces. The impact on many the impact on Imperial morale across the sector was devastating, and, reluctantly, Admiral Ravensburg began to make plans to destroy the remaining Black Fortresses rather than allow them to fall under the Renegade's control. But he was unable to implement them before Cassian seized control of another fortress in the Lukitar system, and then another again at Fularis II. Then the true threat of the Blackstone Fortresses was revealed. The Revenant's command, the Revenant's command, the space stations, combined their energies and unleashed a pulse that cleansed Fularis II of life, of all life. Forced to face both the Chaos Incursion and Imperitical Raids, Battlefleet Gothic was at its breaking point. The pirates were not only human renegades, but also orc freebooters and Eldar Corsairs. The Xenos targeted the Chaos forces as well as the Imperials, but without a stable and secure supply line, Ravensburg was losing battle group after battle group. Then, salvation came for the most unlikely of sources. Recently promoted Admiral Spire managed to establish contact with the Eldar leader in the sector. The exact details are lost to time and the inquisitorial secrecy, but Spire managed to convince the Xenos to join forces against the arch enemy, rather than risk Cassian gaining control of the Blackstone fortresses. 
a prospect that seemed to unnerve even the arrogant Eldar. With the aid of the Eldar, Spire was able to learn the location of the pirate's haven, where all the human renegades of the sector had made their base. With this information, Fleet Admiral Morndrake gathered his forces and struck, destroying almost entire the entirety of human piracy in the sector. Meanwhile, Spire led a daring assault upon the Orc Freebooters, his flagship matching the Greenskins' massive ugly vessels and pounding them into wreckage. With his supply line finally secure, Admiral Ravenberg, Ravensburg focused his full attention upon the Salamanders and their chaotic allies, and went on the offensive. In the Getzame system, his forces encountered a massive splinter of the Chaos Armada and forced it to retreat, only for it to fall in an ambush by the Eldar vessels, who destroyed the fleeing fleet completely. This battle reinforced the uneasy truce between the Eldar and Imperial in the Gothic War, though official documents never actually call it an alliance. This marked the beginning of the Imperium's counterattack. Ravensburg used the division of his enemy to his advantage, striking isolated groups with massive force to wipe them out one by one. Aboard the Ebon Drake, Cassian saw this and understood clearly his foe's strategy, and also understood that he could, not, he could do nothing about it. The Chaos Armada was long since beyond his control, with most ships doing as their captains pleased, gathered in loose packs, rampaging and plundering at will. Only a small core of the fleet remained under his direct command, but even that was a, consider but even that was a considerable force. Especially considering the might of the Ebon Drake and the three Blackstone fortresses. At the same time, the warp storms roused by Vulcan's plots began to abate, and reinforcements from the rest of the Imperium began to arrive in the Gothic sector. The prospect of defeat and the wrath of his Primarch began to creep on the Revenant, and he reacted with all the callousness and cunning of one of the Black Dragon's sons. Cassian launched an all-out raid on the Tartani system, ensuring that the cries for aid of his population would reach the Imperium along with, his, with news of his presence there. Forces of the battlefield Gothic, Agrippina and Cadia rushed in, each captain hungry for the glory that would be his if he could claim the head of the arch-heretic. Before the battle could begin, however, Cassian combined the might of his three Blackstone fortresses and fired it into Tarsanis' son. Before ordering his forces to flee into the warp, mere minutes later, as in the Imperial forces were still trying to figure out what to do, the star went supernova, killing billions and destroying all ships in the system. Ravensburg prepared to go in pursuit, but his elder allies stopped him. They told him that their seers believed Cassian would continue his mission regardless of the risk, and attempts to seize the Blackstone fortresses still in Imperial hands. The Xenos scouts had discovered that his next target the next target of the Revenant would be the Blackstone Fortress orbiting the world of Shindigleist, whatever. Using the webway, both Eldar and Imperial forces arrived to this system, just as the Chaos Armada emerged from the warp, and the final battle of the Gothic War began. Fighting together, Eldar and Imperial ships managed to break the lines of the Chaos Armada, and the heroic sacrifices of Captain Arbridal and his ship prevented the Blackstone Fortresses from doing at Schindlerleist as they had at uh, Tartanis. By sending his ship straight into the energy beam linking the fortresses, the captain disrupted the higher firing mechanism and gave the rest of the fleet time, though it cost his life, and that of his entire crew as his vessel was utterly disintegrated. In the end, with the aid of a contingency of the World Eaters, Ravensburg was able to reclaim one of the Blackstone fortresses Cassian had taken. Sensing that the tide had turned against him, Cassian decided to cut his losses and withdrew his forces, taking the Abon Drake along with his two remaining Blackstone fortresses back with him into the Eye of Terror, abandoning the rest of his forces to slow down Imperial pursuit. Or was I? It took several decades to completely cleanse the Gothic sector of the remnants of the Black Crusade. The names of every member of the Imperial Navy who fought during the Gothic Wars are inscribed upon a gigantic slab of adamantium on Terra, a fighting monument to their heroism. A fitting monument to their heroism. Admiral Spire attempted to pursue Cassian, 
but his forces were defeated, and he was rescued from certain death by sh ships of the 12th Legion, arriving just in time to force the traitors to flee before delivering the killing blow to his crippled ship. He would later prove his worth once more at the Iron Cage, fighting at the side of the Iron Warriors to keep the traitors' legion contained and earning the respect of even Perturabu's dour sons. Of the two Blackstone fortresses stolen by Cassian, nothing was ever heard of again. The remaining fortresses still in Imperial hands were destroyed as it was feared that they would be turned against the Imperium in the future. The Ebon Drake, the Ebon Drake has never been seen since the Gothic War, nor has Cassian Dracos. Where the Reverend survived returning to his Primarch with only two Blackstone fortresses, the Hand of Darkness and the Eye of Night, is unknown even to the Seers of the Thousand Suns and the Agents of the Inquisition. Today the Salamanders are divided as any traitor legion, their ambitions spitting them against one another while their father slumbers on enough wealth to build several entire sectors. And according to the visions of the sanctioned seers and the captured writings of deluded cultists, the wounds inflicted by Mortarion and Magnus 10,000 years ago have long since healed. For now, Vulcan is content to remain in his domain, ruling it with an iron fist while his sons wander the stars in search of wealth and glory. But should the black dragon ever rise from his slumber, leaving the higher ebbs of the great game of chaos behind, the entire legion would gather under him once more, drawn by fear of reprisal and the promise of his plun and the promise of plunder and power. If not by the if not by actual loyalty to the gene sire, should such an event happen, then the only fitting thing that might preserve the iron cage from the wrath of Vulcan might be, ironically enough, the other demon primarchs rising from their own exiles to prevent their brother from claiming that which they themselves have failed to seize. The Disciples of the Dragon One of the most prenocious and enduring cults to have ever plagued the Imperium, the Disciples of the Dragons are heretics spread amongst the Imperium's own ruling elite. Members of this debased cult of worship Vulcan as the... Members of this debased cult worship Vulcan as the true master of mankind, holding that the Emperor was slain at Guliman's hands. They also believe themselves to be Vulcan's chosen, destined to rule over the inferior masses of humanity. In the name of the Black Dragon, of course. The truth is that they are not but pawns, easily cast away by their master, for those who are generally in contact with the Salamander's Legion. Only the most powerful and successful cells manage to draw legionary attention. When they do, the Salamanders use the Disciples to infiltrate the high spheres of Imperial Command and prepare the ground for their own conquest. Several times, an invasion by the 18th Legion has been met with by the Governor and other officials kneeling before the invaders, only for the people themselves to rally behind new low-born leaders of the Disciples. Wait, only for the people themselves to rally behind new low-born leaders that the disciples would never have considered worthy of including in their plans. Whether or not such resistance appeared is often the only thing preventing an Inquisitor from declaring exterminatus on a planet whose lord surrendered without a fight. Capture records and journals of cultists have revealed that the same pattern repeats itself in the creation of every cell. Of indiv an individual of some influence with, the, with greed and ambition, favored by the salamanders and with latent psychic powers, will receive, will receive visions featuring Vulcan himself. These visions will twist his mind and grant him infernal knowledge, turning him into a prophet of the Black Dragon. He, or she, gender does not seem to play a part, any part in this, will then start to recruit others, drawing them with the promise of greater wealth and power. Where the visions are actually sent by the demon Primarch, or by a lesser Neverborn posing as him is unknown. Certainly, some of the cult leaders of the Disciples have displayed mutations similar to those generally observed upon the Salamanders, and their sorcerers have shown some mastery of the dreaded arts of resurrection, using them to increase their hold over the cult. The suppression of all knowledge related to the Runes' power in the Imperium actively works against the Inquisition in fighting the Disciples. Each cell believes itself to be the first of its kind, 
the true chosen of the draconic god, god rather than just another band of foolish puppets. The disciples seek to gather power and wealth while weakening the hold of the Imperium adep Imperial Adepta at the same time, with the goal of one day seizing the reins of power from themselves. They perform regular ceremonies in which they pay homage to Vulcan in return for dark, for dark gifts from their patron. Such is the corruption caused by these rituals that cultists turning on each other is common, especially at what should have been the cult's moment of triumph. <laughs>